Hey guys, welcome to part two of my technical paper research for my Master of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences for the University of Florida. I'm McKenna, if you didn't watch my, my first video, and my research was, it, it was all online. I didn't do any in-person research. I finished this whole degree during COVID, so nothing like that. Um, but it was on the effects of plastics on corals and other coral reef invertebrates. And in this video, I'll be getting into the effects of plastics on all those different animals. So let's get started. All right, so coral and plastic interactions. They can interact via adhesion. So like the plastic will in adhere to the outside of the coral or even the inside and ingestion by the corals. This is especially prevalent, ingestion is especially prevalent in deep sea corals because they lack the algal symbionts that provide them with, that like photosynthesize and provide the corals with food. So they rely more on heterotrophy, which is basically just them grabbing their own food. And then when they ingest the plastics, they can give them a, the plastics can give the, the corals a false sense of satiation. This is deep sea or shallow water or, or anywhere in the water column. Um, and that false sense of satiation keeps the coral from reaching out and actually grabbing food with real nutrients, or at least doing it less often. And then corals can also, they can grow around microplastics to try to avoid any harmful effects by them. They can also remove the plastics via ingestion. And even though they could grow around them or ingest them, which is just basically regurgitation kind of thing, um, they still retain a lot of the plastics. And one study in the Zisha Islands, there are other names for them, um, in the South China Sea found that polyps still had an average of 44 plastic items. And then off of, I believe it was Jamestown, Rhode Island, they found an average of 112 plastic items per polyp. So they're still there and nearly everyone, if not everyone. And when corals um ingest or interact with plastics and you will ingest really they go through energetic costs so for getting any food item plastic or actual food they go through energetic costs of the capture and the ingestion however with the plastics they have the extra energetic costs of egestion or overgrowth plus let's not forget the faucets the satiation which causes them to eat less and overall get less energy throughout the day. Um, they can also, the plastics can also cause a reallocation of energy for digestion, overgrowth, and other things caused by corals will get or caused by the plastics we'll get into later. And so that reallocation of energy can come from immune system function, reproduction, growth, and other things that are vital to a coral's fitness or ability to survive and reproduce. If it's gonna turn, let's see. Okay. So the effects of microplastics on coral zooxanthellae relationship. These zooxanthellae are those algal symbionts that I mentioned, um, the photosynthetic algae. So, these microplastics, the zooxanthellae live within the coral tissues and the microplastics can actually settle in the tissues where the zooxanthellae would go and it obviously then the zooxanthellae can't get in and this can cause a disruption between chemical of chemical signals between zooxanthellae and the corals. It also reduces the um, symbiont photosynthesis and then other effects on the, the symbionts include reducing the symbiont's growth, density, detoxification abilities, and nutrient uptake, as well as increasing the symbiont's oxidative stress and apoptosis level, which if you remember from science, apoptosis is cell death. 
So like the cells just pop, um, which is never good, really, unless it's like a cancer cell, then that's good. But yeah, you get the point. Um, and then this has been associated with bleaching and tissue necrosis. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about coral bleaching. So the corals get their colors from the zooxanthellae. And so not only do they provide nutrients, they provide the color. And then when the zooxanthellae can't settle on the coral or the coral gets stressed, the coral will release the zooxanthellae and that causes the bleaching. And this also, since they're getting less food from the um, photosynthesis by the symbionts, it increases, at least for shallow water coral, since deep sea pretty much always relies on heterotrophy anyway, but it will increase the shallow water coral's reliance on heterotrophy. And that means they'll be reaching out to try to grab more food and they'll be more likely to grab more microplastics. Other effects of plastics on corals. So these include multiple types of alterations. They, the plastics can increase antioxidant enzyme activity, decrease the amount of detoxifying enzymes, and decrease immunity enzymes. It, the decrease in immunity enzymes can explain the increase in opportunistic parasites found on corals that have been exposed to microplastics. These plastics can also alter gene expression, um, metabolite profiles, which are basically like what is produced when an organism like breaks down food, digests food. Um, so for us, not to be a little gross or anything, but like a metabolite for us would be, um, oh, what is it? Like, it, they would come out in like our urine. So it would decrease, and obviously corals don't have urine, but if we had something messing with our metabolite profiles, we might see like a darker colored urine or something like that. And you know something was off. And then reproductive success. So there are definitely reproductive anomalies associated with plastics and corals. They, the plastics can decrease fertilization success, lead to poor larval development, and then lead to embryo abnormalities in corals. They also decrease skeletal growth and calcification. And then plastics can lead to direct mortality of corals. And then on here you can, I did not mean to put this on the side, but you can see there's like um, biofilms of different pathogens that can grow on a plastic surface. And I'll get into that later. Okay, so corals and plastics. Macroplastics can have effects on corals on microplastics can't or can't to the extent that macroplastics have that same effect. So macroplastics frequently lead to injuries and physical abrasions. This can increase, this can lead to the invasion of foreign pathogens. And then when those foreign pathogens evade, the corals have to reallocate energy, more energy to the immune system to help fight those pathogens. And that also takes away energy from healing that wound. So more pathogens can get in and it kind of just seems like a vicious circle at this point. Macroplastics can also snag on corals, smother them and block sunlight from them. This leads to decreased skeletal growth, decreased prey capture rates and decreased energy acquisition. And then the low oxygen conditions, especially when it comes to blocking sunlight, um, can favor microbial growth. And then the study that looked at macroplastics larger than 55 millimeters in the Asia Pacific Reef, which I mentioned in my first video, linked down below, um, led to a jump from a four, per, okay, led, yes. So without the macroplastics, there's a four, about a 4% 4 risk of a coral becoming diseased. 
with microplastic interaction, that risk of disease jumped to 89% on average. And then skeletal eroding band disease, white and jumps, and black band disease are some of the diseases that, that um, increased in prevalence with it when this happened. And they are all associated with rapid mortality of corals. And then, okay, so more structurally complex corals are eight times more likely to have macroplastics like snag on them and less smother them, block their sunlight. But coral and those structure, more structurally complex corals are like branching corals, like the elkhorn and staghorn corals. And then corals with rounded and massive morphologies, like brain corals, actually had a disease risk jump to an average of 98% when exposed to macroplastics. And so here you can see some of the results from the study from just a few of their many, many sites. And you can see um, on the left side when the the corals that didn't have any plastic debris associated with them or macroplastic debris, it was all, their risk of disease was all pretty low, below 25%. And then on the right side with plastic debris, you can see at least the inner quartile range, which is like the 25 to 75% of samples um, in like the middle were at least 50%, but a number of them were like straight up at just around 100%, which is kind of scary. Okay, so plastics can also act as contaminant vectors. So they can, that should be adsorb, not absorb, because it's just hanging around the abs outside, not like kind of pulled into the plastic. Um, but these can include toxic compounds, organic pollutants, and aqueous metals. Um, so basically that'd be stuff like DDTs, PCBs, BPA, antibiotics, pesticides, and heavy metals amongst other things. Um, and actually one study in the Gulf of Manar in India, which is just off the southern tip, a little to the east, um, they found lead, copper, cadmium, and other heavy metals in greater concentrations on microplastics than they actually found them in the surrounding sediment. And then, so these contaminants can bioaccumulate um, once the microplastics are ingested by um, corals and other, and other invertebrates. This applies to the, um, those other coral reef invertebrates as well, and then work their way up the food web. And then the contaminants can also be released into the environment as plastics degrade, which for some of them makes them more bioavailable for species to consume. And then um, PAE, polyaryl ether. Um, so scleractinian corals had a greater, which is like, you know, those branching corals, reef building corals, ecosystem engineer corals, whatever you want to call them. They had a greater than 95% contamination rate of polyaryl ether, um, which is, oh, no, the polyaryl ether in scleractin corals had a greater than 95% con contamination rate. I'm just, yeah, we got it. Okay. Um, and then, okay. The effects of these contaminants. So HBC, DD, don't ask me what that means, or you can in the comments, but it's not coming off the top of my head right now. And flame retardants can um, be retained and bioaccumulated within Stalophora pistillata corals, and that has led to polyp retraction. And so polyps are just, a polyp is an individual coral. So when you see a coral, it's, you're really seeing a coral colony and it's made up of a bunch of little polyps. Um, so yeah, think back to like the first video when I said, you know, an average of 114 or an average of 44 plastic particles per polyp. 
multiply that by sometimes several hundred and that's how much is in just that one colony. Um, but yeah, that polyp retraction renders those polyps unable to capture prey, limits their gas and dissolved nutrient exchange with seawater, and um, decreases the photosynthetic rates of their symbionts. This leads to um, a long-term decrease in energy reserves and colony growth. And so um, the contaminants associated with microplastics can also act as phagostimulants, which means they're gonna encourage the corals and other invertebrates to keep eating more, wanting to eat more, which means they could ingest more microplastics. It's also associated with cellular toxicity, decreased energy reserves in crabs and marine worms, decreased metabolic rates and survival in mussels, and decrease in development, growth, and survival of Daphne species, which are common water fleas. And then, like plastics can act as contaminant vectors, they can also act as micro vectors. So these can be disease-causing microbes and others, but numerous of them have been found on plastics. And remember, I believe it was a few slides back, I showed how biofilms can accumulate on a, on a piece of plastic. Well, those, when those plastics are ingested, those microbes can obviously cause disease in those corals. Um, and then but biofilm can increase the chance of ingestion because the coral is more likely to mistake that microplastic as an actual food source. And then because of the travelability of microplastics, like how they can move around in ocean currents and winds and macroplastics as well, it can potentially lead to species introduction. So one pathogen might be prevalent in say the Indian Ocean, but that gets carried over to, um, let's just say the Bering Sea somehow, um, that, can lead to a new species of pathogen being introduced there. And pathogens kind of co-evolve with species in their environment. So that doesn't always mean that just because a fish has a, or any organism has a pathogen, it doesn't mean they're diseased, especially when it's a pathogen that they have co-evolved with. Um, it's really only if their immune system is compromised in some way that they'll pass away, like with COVID, we have been worried about people with compromised immune systems. For the rest of us, it we have been told it's not that big of an issue for us, but we don't want to go around spreading spreading it because someone with an immune compromised immune system, if they get it, they'll actually pass away. So that's kind of like how it is with pathogens and um, organisms that have co-evolved together, but you take that pathogen, introduce it to a new environment where they, those species have not co-evolved with that pathogen, then those species are more likely to experience a rapid mortality and potential um, local extinction, which I haven't found anything on local extinction associated with microbes on plastics, but it, who knows it could be happening, we don't know. Um, okay, so they uh, there's also found to be more microbes associated with plastics in tropical regions, which are obviously where a lot of coral reefs are. And the examples of microbes that have been found on plastics are Vibrio species, which are responsible for white band disease, um, bleaching, and other coral health issues, and, well, and invertebrate health issues. And then Vibrio species, Rhodobacteraceae family, and the family of Flavobacteraceae. I think I'm pronouncing them right, but you can read. Um, they are known to cause multiple, multiple diseases among other reef invertebrates and have severe adverse effects on the marine food web. And then Vibrio again, and then Pseudomonas species, 
and Lepsolingria species are, oh, okay, back up. The first three can cause coral tissue damage. The second three are the ones known to cause multiple diseases among all the reef, among lots of the reef invertebrates and have severe first effects on the marine food web. We clarified that. Okay, hollow folliculina species are protozoa that are responsible for skeletal eroding band disease. So not all protozoa are good. Not all of them are like the band from Xenon, which is what I think about every single time I read protozoa. Please let me know if you're listening. Um, and then one laboratory experiment on Astrangia poculata corals found that the ingestion of microbeads with E. coli biofilms led to the death of the corals after four weeks. All right, so sea urchins and plastics. They can actually, plastics in laboratory studies that use environmentally realistic microplastic concentrations, there are insignificant effects on sea urchins. So this is possibly because um, the sea urchins using their cilia and pediciliae on the surface of their tests, which is their outer body surface, um, can remove plastic particles from that body surface. And there was found to be no difference in their writing time when exposed to plastics or oxygen consumption, at least in oxygen consumption in some species. Um, these sea urchins can also move to areas of more suitable conditions. Um, they showed no feeding preferences towards plastics. And then something really interesting is that sea urchins can act as bioerogers of plastics. So they can readily graze on a plastic surface and they will do this whether food is present or not. And then when they graze on it, it degrades the plastics into smaller pieces, um, which most of those plastics become biofouled by their, the sea urchin's fecal matter and sink to the benthos, which makes them, like the ocean bottom, which makes them more available to the animals that live there. And then, yeah, so they become more available. But when laboratory studies use microplastic concentrations greater than those found in the environment, um, which can be helpful, and I'll get into that in video three, they found that the sea urchins definitely had micro microplastic ingestion, um, but those microplastics could also enter the urch urchin via their water vascular system. And adverse effects include um, so toxic effects, this includes the embryos, um, reduction in larval viability, viability by increasing the rate of larval development anomalies and decreasing larval growth. And that can ultimately lead to alterations in sea urchin population structure. Sea urchins also experience decreased fertilization success. Um, that rate decreased by 18 to 32%. There was an increase in the production of reactive oxygen species, um, which is not a good thing. I'll just say that. And then reduction in oxygen consumption in some species. So yeah, some species, no effect, some species reduction, and then it could also lead to direct mortality. And then these different effects are based on species and the size of the microplastics. And again, um, Currently, studies have shown insignificant effects at current realistic microplastic concentrations. But like I've said, uh, like many people saying, plastics are always increasing and macroplastics degrade into microplastics. So that concentration is definitely always increasing and will forever be increasing. So plastics and other coral reef invertebrates. They also have accidental and intentional ingestion. Um, and a lot of them, so bivalves, polychaetes, and bivalves are like clams and stuff, um, crustaceans, shellfish, barnacles, sea cucumbers, and starfish are known to mistakenly and intentionally ingest microplastics. Um, there, have been, there has been excretion 
Oh, and increased bioavailability and bioaccumulation of those plastics. Um, yeah. And then some of the species actually avoid microplastics of a similar size to their prey, but will ingest plastics smaller than their prey, while other invertebrates have shown no preferences between food and plastics, and some even prefer plastics over food. Okay, so this ingestion of plastics increases bioavailability and bioaccumulation of them. And there has been excretion documented in copepods, mussels, oysters, and other invertebrates. Um, but again, microplastics are still retained. And adverse effects um, can include internal and physical abrasions and perforations, decreased feeding activity, increased pathogen exposure, and a um, clogged gastrointestinal tract, which prevents the plastics from leaving and it can lead to toxin accumulation within an individual. And then so some species specific examples, min, um, plastics, that plastics have had on invertebrates. For manila clams, they experienced a decreased filtration rate histologically altered tissues in their gills. So like there's just look up histology, you'll see, and it's kind of hard to explain, but like you can see differences in cell patterns and stuff, and it's indicative of disease. Um, and then there were also histologically altered tissues in their digestive glands, and then they experienced oxidative stress, Chinese man crabs also experienced oxidative stress and they had dec decreased growth. Sea snails experienced slower growth rates as well. Mediterranean mussels had cellular toxicity. Aptasia sea anemones had experienced a dis so sea anemones are in the same are cnidarians like corals are and they have symbiotic algae as well. So the plastics have disrupted their relationship with their symbiotic algae and decrease, thus decrease algal photosynthesis and limited the sea anemone's nutrient supply. And then tangled balls of fibers have been found in crabs. Amphipods and marine worms experienced lower survival rates and energy reserves, and marine copepods experienced decreased algal, algal consumption, which led to a decrease in fecundity so like their ability to reproduce and reproduce, reproduce successfully, um, decrease growth and decrease survival. And this diagram kind of just shows that plastics can affect all levels of biological organization from subatomic level to cell level to organ level, organism level and population level, which can ultimately lead to um, shifts in communities. So say from like algal dominated to, or coral dominated to algal dominated, uh, which is not good for structural complexity or anything like that. And if you haven't watched the first video, you should to get an idea of what structural complexity is and how it's important. And then, so plastics and other coral reef invertebrates now, more specifically, so the macroplastics can also, some of them cause mechanical damage, entangle them and so on. And it's also associated with increased disease prevalence. And then there were some, be and then behavioral disorders noted in studies taken at environmentally realistic microplastic concentrations. In Aurelia jellyfish, they experienced immobility and altered pulsation frequency. So you can see in this picture um, how you can see all the little microplastics that they ingested, like all the little green spheres. And then mycid shrimp experienced less success capturing prey and in um, impaired swimming competence. And then with when the classics kill coral reefs, it decreases the structural complexity, which provides many microhabitats to all these different invertebrates. And so the loss of microhabitats can lead to a decrease in biomass of all these animals. Okay, so that is it for
this video